Barbara, maybe we should make the announcement about the mass next week at nine o'clock. Okay. okay, next week is the Feast of St. Ignatius of Loyola, wow. the founder of the Society of Jesus and patron of our church. So next week at nine o'clock will be an extra special mass. Uh, Father Greg, John, and I will be concelebrating. I will be the principal celebrant, Father John will preach, and Greg will join in. So, we, you know, we invite any or all to join in. Uh, right after Mass, I'll have myself set up in the parish office. And so I will race over after Mass to begin the class. So you can... In, so you can begin at nine o'clock and work till about 1130 <laughs> on the St. Ignatius website. And uh, welcome all of you. So, uh, you know, it, it's always a special feast for us and I welcome any and all of you. And let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Loving Father, we turn to you. Continue to send forth your spirit into our lives. Knowledge is true. It has helped us to understand the gift of your son. You know, as we face our history, we realize the darkness, but also the light. So continue to watch over us. Help us to truly understand our history because it gives power for today. So sustain us in your love, let your Holy Spirit watch over us. And I'd like to say a little prayer. I was asked to pray for Emmanuel and I am. I hope I'm pronouncing the last name correctly. Uh, I want to pray for him, that the Lord would be with him and his family. Uh, I heard he's very sick, so I want to lift him up. So if anybody, for one minute, and I mean for one minute, if people could just mention a name, and say living or deceased. Anybody? Frank Kennedy. Kennedy. Living. Patty Lasher, deceased. Al Copolillo, living. Deceased. Mary Jonathan, deceased. 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 William Barnwell, deceased. Carl Kruger and um, Terry deceased. Okay. Michael is living. So we lift them all up to you, Lord. Watch over them. For those who have died, may they truly be in, the king, in your kingdom. May their families find comfort in the great gift. That one day they shall see their loved ones again. Those that are ill, those that need our prayers. Watch over them and their families. And we offer this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, welcome all of you. For this session, we're going to go into different themes. There's a lot going on. And so it's going to, a lot of things overlap. So we're going to have to take themes. And then we'll go back and we'll also see the same period. For instance, as we get into the Middle Ages, you, you have to take a look at the church and its problems. You have to look at the rise of the universities. Uh, so, uh, wait, wait, hold on a second. Yes. Okay. So you see the rise of the universities and uh, the rise of the national states. All of these things are happening. And so I'm going to have to take themes. Now, secondly, at the end, ask questions. See, one of the, one of the powers of an historian is method. I am not an encyclopedia. I'm not necessarily going to be able to answer all your questions. What the power of an historian is, is ask the question. To some of you, I might have to say, I have to look it up. I mean, that's part of it is, as an historian is knowing where to find the answer. Okay, so the Dark Ages, very briefly. Europe was very much divided. 
what you find is you really do not find the national states. What you find is warlords. There are bright spots that are going to exist during the Dark Ages, the monasteries. The monasteries exist as orphanages, schools, hospitals. They're up in the mountain and there is individual lights. But travel is very dangerous. You never know where you're going to be received. And so Europe is very disjointed. Uh, as I say, you have warlords in one area or the other. And so what happens is in, in one city, there might be a certain enlightenment. And then suddenly its leader is assassinated. And so at times during the Dark Ages, it's two steps forward and then three steps backward. Okay, now, but gradually what you're beginning to find in people like Charlemagne is they're beginning to bring an order to Europe. They're beginning to create an order where people can travel from one state to another. And so Europe begins to emerge out of this tremendous disunity and disjointed system and where there begins to be order. Okay, so one of the things I wanna talk about is the end of the Crusades. I mentioned them last week. One of the key things, and many people don't realize this, the Pope interest in the Crusades was primarily to save the Eastern Roman Empire. He really believed that if the West saved the Eastern Roman Empire, then there would be a reunion of the churches. Uh, because of language difficulties and things like this, the churches had really drifted apart. He wants a reunion. And so he feels that if he could assist the Byzantine Empire, uh, in 1095, there is what we call the Battle of Manzenkert. And the natural frontier for the Byzantine Empire on the eastern end of Anatolia, the Anatolian plain in Anatolia is present day Turkey. For centuries, the Byzantines had helped through mountain fortresses had held the line. The Turks break through, and this exposes the whole Anatolian plain to their incursions, and it's going to badly weaken the Byzantine Empire. So the Pope says, okay, let's help it. Let's help the Byzantine Empire to once again have its natural frontier against the East. Okay, that's the reason he calls the Crusades. However, he fully realizes that's not going to sell. To say we're out to help the Byzantine Empire is going to get yawns. Uh, one thing you learn is there's a big difference between the real reason for a war and the selling of the war. So he has to sell it. So what he does is he said, let's save the Holy Land. Let's rescue it from the power of the Arabs and the Turks and once again have a Christian land. Okay, it's wonderful intentions. However, the Pope fails to realize is all of these people, many times they are brothers of the heads of state. They want to carve out a little kingdom. And what they do basically is they further weaken the Byzantine Empire. You know, in the West, we talk about the Crusades as a great moment. When you get into the Eastern churches, they hate them. They really feel they were uh, a disaster, a disaster that was going to eventually end with the total collapse of Constantinople and the Byzantine Empire. And uh, uh, all right. Now, there was one pilgrimage, there was one uh, crusade, the fourth crusade in 1204. It arrives, a disorganized bunch of people without any money. Now, what you have to realize is 
that the two great rivals for trade in the Mediterranean were Venice and Constantinople. All right, they get to Venice. What Venice does is it says, we will provide transportation if you will sack Constantinople. So what they do is uh, they come in, in Venetian ships. Uh, Constantinople allows them into its harbor. It had a very well defended harbor. The men arrive there, they sacked, and they kill the emperor, and they set up their own kingdom. The pope was livid. He was furious. He excommunicated the leaders in Venice. What happened is there was no follow through. Uh, the people from Venice set up a Latin, what they called the Latin Kingdom of Constantinople, and they announced reunion with Rome. Unfortunately, the Pope didn't hold to his guns. And so what he said is, okay, we have union. And so he released his excommunications and he allowed it to happen. Okay, this, uh, there was a state from 1204 to 1261 that was basically run by Westerners. And uh, so it was the Latin state of Constantinople. In 1261, the locals revolt and they drive them out. And it reverts to being a Byzantine capital. But as far as, as uh, as far as for relations between the West and the East, they're dead. The West is never going to be forgiven for what it did. And as I say, for them, the Crusades were a disaster. Uh, they really feel the Crusades were what led to the ultimate collapse of the Byzantine Empire, that it never fully recovered from them. Now, what's gonna happen in the West where there's a whole different thing is, suddenly the knowledge of the East is brought back to the West. You know, one of the key things is, uh, and I remember when I was in studies, try to do mathematics such as multiplication with Roman numerals, <laughs> the Roman system. I, I, you know, when I was teaching class in history, I would spend one day with the kids trying to show them how mathematics worked in the Roman numeral system. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, this is one of the limitations that they had. The Crusaders bring back the Arabic system, which is a decimal system. And it is surprisingly, once you have that in Western Europe, you're gonna to begin to, you know, have leapfrogs and you're gonna have explosive development once you have a decent mathematical system. But they also bring back a great deal of knowledge in philosophy, medicine, science. Uh, the Arabs had developed a great culture. You know, while Europe, for instance, is in the maze of its dark ages, you find that the university in Babylon, uh, Baghdad, is way ahead of anything in Western Europe, in engineering, mathematics, uh, physics. This stuff begins to be brought back to Europe. And it's this knowledge that is going to eventually lead to the Renaissance. Uh, the Renaissance is a great deal dependent on the Crusades and what they brought back. So from a Western perspective, it's something very, very important in our history. It really was a step forward with the knowledge that they brought back to Western Europe. All right, just very briefly for two minutes. Any questions on that? Okay, now, uh, one of the things that begins to happen is the rise of universities in Europe. 
Uh, and this is a great sign of the beginning of the end of the Dark Ages to the medieval period. Now, probably the oldest university in the West is the University of Bologna. Now, these are all church sponsored. Uh, you know, all of them are church sponsored. So the oldest university is the University of Bologna in Italy. Now remember, Italy is a series of city-states. There is no such thing as Italy or even Germany at this time. Uh, France is emerging, England a little bit. Uh, there is a series of city-states, but Bologna is the oldest of the universities in the West. This is going to be followed by Oxford. So you have 1088 is the University of Bologna. Oxford comes along in, in 1096. Uh, then you have Paris in 1150, followed by uh, Cambridge, 1209, Coimbra, uh, 1240. Uh, so the universities suddenly break out. And pretty much they are at, at the beginning. They're for theology and philosophy, but they begin to include physics, math, science, uh, the humanities, writing. But this is a major step in Western Europe and uh, as they continue. And so, and they are all church sponsored. Uh, you know, when you go, for instance, to Oxford, if you ever visit it, it's so evident just in the names of these universities, they were all church sponsored. For instance, the University of Paris grows out of the Cathedral School of Notre Dame. And uh, that starts it, and it happens to be some professors begin the Sorbonne in uh, 1150, but it grows out of the Cathedral School of Notre Dame. Now, one little thing, you know, just, uh, I really didn't prepare this, but there was something in the paper today, and I think is in the 30s, Ataturk in Turkey, this is about the Hagia Sophia, Ataturk had toppled the Ottoman empress. The Ottoman Empire had really fallen into uh, disgrace. Uh, Ataturk revolted. He was a leader of the Turkish army. He revolted against the Ottoman Emperor, overthrew him, and established a republic. And what he changed for Turkey was he adapted the European alpha alphabet. He changed, you know, in other words, it was Arabic, but he introduced the European alphabet, the Western European alphabet. He made it a secular state. He moved the capital out of Constantinople and established uh, a new city, Ankara, as the new capital. And he also changed the name of the city from Constantinople to Istanbul. So while Istanbul remained the financial center of Turkey, it was no longer the capital, and it became a secular republic. Okay, the Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia means uh, wisdom of God, the holy wisdom. And this refers to Jesus Christ. You know, time and again, we talk about Jesus as the divine word, the word of God that comes incarnate. In the Eastern Church, it was very important also the sense of Jesus is the divine wisdom, the holy wisdom. So around 550, Justinian, the Byzantine emperor, built this wonderful cathedral called the Hagia Sophia. It was, as far as for the Western world was concerned, the largest building in the world. It's an enormous structure. And so it stood for 900 years as a Christian church. When Constantinople fell to the Turks in 1453, it became a mosque. So 
Part of it is, among Muslims, like the Jews, they're very much against charactering or painting anything living because they're afraid of idolatry. So you'll, you will almost never see Jewish or Muslim art that covers animals, human beings. They're afraid of idolatry. Uh, it's all geometric art. If you've ever seen pictures of the Alhambra in Spain with the amount of art that is carried there, it's geometric. Okay. The great mosaics in the Hagia Sophia were whitewashed over. They were painted over. And it became a mosque. They built the towers, the torrents. And it became a mosque until I think it was 1934, when Ataturk decided it should become a museum. So up until this day, it has been a museum. Now, the Turkish president has decided it's going to be restored as a mosque. And this has caused a great deal of consternation. You know, it just, it's, uh, and it really has been condemned by most Western states because of a desecration of a building that really was a museum to two great religions. And so if you read in the Chronicle, or I guess it was in the, uh, I'm not sure it was the Chronicle or the Times, the, he appointed some imams who will basically be the pastors for Hagia Sophia. But what they're going to do with the mosaics, I do not know. But I really see it as, you know, a real problem. All right. Sorry for the parenthesis. Okay. So in the West, you have the great universities. And they began to, uh, you know, in, this is the enlightenment that's beginning to exist in Western Europe. Now, one of the other important rises is the town. As you have greater peace, uh, villages begin to turn to towns. You see the rise of towns throughout Western Europe. Uh, and this becomes the, the biggest thing is, uh, you don't have any great big cities yet, but you're beginning to have towns that might have 10, 20, 30,000 people. And this becomes in, the 1200s, a big change in Europe. And what you find, for instance, is the, uh, the craft unions, where and the, and trade begins to increase, and people are beginning to travel from one place to another. Okay, as towns increase, and this once again is an important part of our church and the presence of the spirit in our life. What happens is the rise of the mendicant orders, especially of men. See, the big area for the church up to this time are the monasteries. They are on the mountains. They're on hit mountaintops for protection. Suddenly now you have a church that is finding its future in the towns. And so what you have is, and I think it's the gift of the spirit. The spirit calls forth in the church, and there are gonna be four major mendicant orders created. Mendicant orders that beg, but they remain in the towns. Uh, what you have is, first of all, the Dominicans, St. Dominic gets together his community of Dominicans. Now, his rule is going to be adopted by many communities of sisters. Uh, someone has said that uh, only God knows what's in a woman's purse or how many Dominican communities of sisters there are. And so, you know, uh, I, sorry I don't insult anyone. But anyway, uh, you know, there, there are, you know, right in this area, for instance, we have two Dominican communities. We have the Dominicans of San Rafael and the Dominicans of Mission San Jose. 
And other than the fact that they all follow the Dominican rule, there's no connection. There's a third Dominican community that works in the area, the Adrian community, Dominicans out of uh, Michigan. Okay, uh, so we have Dominicans throughout the world that follow the community. The important ones are the men. Dominic starts this community and they're called the Order of Preachers. Uh, the term used, if you ever see, is a Dominican is OP, Order Predicatores, the Order of Preachers. And Dominic wants them really to spread the knowledge of the church through preaching, through teaching. Uh, he wants them in the town. And so what you find is these are communities that move to the towns. They found priories, abbeys, whatever you want to call it, residences, and they are there. And the Dominican spread very, very quickly. Uh, and so, for instance, later on, the, you know, the Dominicans, for instance, in San Francisco, uh, San Francisco in Oakland, they have a major presence of Venetia. Uh, so right up to this time, we've been really a gift of the Dominicans. Then you have the Franciscans shortly afterwards, uh, and Francis. Now, Francis founds his community, and Francis is a wonderful saint, but it's really charismatic. Uh, Francis gathers followers, and he sort of establishes a rule. But what they really need is someone that can give some order and stability to it. So one of the followers that eventually of Francis is going to be St. Bonaventure. Bonaventure uh, basically gives order to this wonderful charism of St. Francis. He gives order in you know, rules, regulations, and uh, it begins to change the community. When you look at Francis, the vast majority of Franciscans were brothers, not priests. In fact, the whole meaning of the term, uh, OFM, Order of Friars Minor, Ordo Fratresses Minorum, Order of Friars Minor. Friars in church law is brothers. So Francis emphasized they were brothers. And some would become priests, but the majority would be brothers. Under Bonaventure, when he gives uh, sort of a, a order to everything, they begin to be much more clericalized, where uh, to be a superior in the community, you have to be a priest. They all take the same vows, the solemn vows of a order, but uh, much more they're clericalized under St. Bonaventure. Now, very quickly, the, the Franciscans are going to morph into basically three orders. All are OFM. They are going to split over the question of poverty. So, uh, those that are just have OFM after your name, I will call the regulars just for the ease of this class. Okay, so what you have is a group of Franciscans feel that they've lost their way. They have missed the poverty that Francis brought in. They are going to split off. Uh, at first they have a separate provincial and then they become basically a second community. And that's the Capuchins. The Capuchins split off from the community and they basically have established themselves as a separate community. They have their own father general, they have their own saints, and they begin to have a totally separate history. They look to Francis as their founder, but they have become a second community. Then later on from the regulars, you have another split off. Uh, and again, it's over poverty. And uh, what you have is some reformers uh, want to make, once again, the poverty stricter. 
You have a group that doesn't want to, and they split off, and uh, they become the conventuals. So what you have is the regulars. And the regulars, for instance, in San Francisco, just to, the regulars would have St. Boniface. They run St. Anthony's Kitchen. They are just OFM. You then have the, the second community, the Capuchins. How you see after their name is OFM, uh, C-U-P-H. They, that's how they designate themselves. They're Franciscans, but a separate community from the regulars. They have a parish, I think it's Our Lady of the Angels in San Mateo. So they're present in the diocese. The third one are the conventuals. And the conventuals is OFM with an C-O-N-V. Uh, where they were present in San Francisco is they had St. Paul of the Shipwreck. That was one of their missions in the city. So all three Franciscan communities labored in San Francisco. And of course, it was the regulars that founded the missions. Uh, all the missions of San Francisco were founded by the OFMs. And uh, so they're very strong in our history. Now, one of the things with uh, the Feast of St. Ignatius coming up. The OFMs took over the mission legacy of the Jesuits. If you ever look at some of the missions in Baja, California, many of them have not Franciscan names, but Jesuit names. Because the Jesuits had moved up. They were very strong, for instance, in uh, New Mexico and Arizona. Uh, San Javier del Bac is a mission founded by the Jesuits and they were very strong there with Eusebio Aquino. And uh, there was a very strong presence of the Jesuits there. In Baja California, the Jesuits had the missions. Uh, we were suppressed in the 1770s. Uh, we were first kicked out of all of the Portuguese and Spanish territories. And so when we were kicked out, the Franciscans were given the mandate to continue the mission work. So we were kicked out. And so all the Jesuits in the Spanish and Portuguese territories of South and Central America and Mexico were simply put on boats and shipped off to Italy. Later on, under pressure from Portugal, in Spain, especially, the Pope decided to suppress the order. And the order was simply told, you no longer exist. Now, we managed to stay alive, mainly because the Pope was bothered by the fact in Spain and Portugal, when the Jesuits were kicked out, the government confiscated all the Jesuit properties. The Pope felt this was wrong. They belonged to the church, not the state. So in the bull of suppression, he put in one little thing that this would only take effect when the local bishop proclaimed it. And that was really very different from almost every other bull. As soon as it was read in Rome, the bull took effect. He wants the bishops to be able to have a chance to gain the property. And so he says, it only is read, it only takes effect when the local bishop reads it. Okay. Russia and Prussia don't allow it to be read. Uh, Catherine the Great hates the Bourbons, which are Portugal, Spain, France. You know, they talk about the fact that she's German. She's not related. She has no Russian blood in her. She killed her husband and seized the throne. Uh, so she hates the Bourbons. So she's trying to get back at them. So she tells the, the bishops, especially in that area of Poland that is now taken over by Russia, that they are not to proclaim and uh, Catherine is not a sweet woman. 
I, and I mean that. She is not a sweet woman, and she means her words because one bishop decided to challenge her. He reads the letter. She ordered him to be castrated. So that ended it. No other bishop had the courage to defy her. So uh, we did remain alive. Okay, so back to the Franciscans, very prominent in California history, but basically three different communities. Then at the same time as towns emerge, you have the Carmelites. Now the Carmelites had existed uh, in little groups. They were founded on Mount Carmel, and the name is the community of Our Lady of Mount Carmel. And that's where they get the name Carmelites. Uh, and there was a rule that they had, as they look back to about the year 800. Okay. As towns emerge, the Carmelites come together. And once again, they set up a rule in an order and they come together. So in 1214, you have the first gathering of the Carmelites. And uh, so the Carmelites, you know, gather once again in monasteries. And so they gather as a community approved by Rome. Uh, the Carmelites are gonna split. Uh, when, you, when you see John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila, uh, they both do a reform. So what you have is you basically have two Carmelite orders. One has O'Carm, O'Carm after his name. The other is uh, OCD, Order of Carmelites Discalced. It's the reform brought about by John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila. The fourth very important community is the Augustinians. Once again, it's a rule based on Augustine's writing. They remained sort of hermits, small communities. In 1244, they once again come together and they establish a rule, elect a father general. So these are key communities that are gathered because they bring the church to the people, they stress education, training of priests. And uh, in the emergence of the church and starting in the 1200s, they're very, very key. You know, for instance, you have uh, Albert the Great, one of the great teachers at the University of Paris, and you know, a real Renaissance man with his knowledge. So it, it, it's once again the spirit calling the church together. The church, this was needed. You needed priests now in the towns, priests that, that could preach well. And these four communities are going to be right at the center. Okay, let's take a look at the church. I've been reading a book which is about all the popes. It's a very brief, maybe six paragraphs each of the popes. What you find is remarkable is after about the year 600, what you find is almost every other pope, when they list his cause of death, is assassinated, murdered. About every other one dies a natural death. The church is facing real problems. What you have is, is some of the mighty families in Rome are trying to control the papacy for their own end. And so, for instance, you hear about somebody who's 18 years old is elected as Pope, who lived till he was 37 when he was murdered. Uh, the church and its leadership is in trouble. Uh, the buying and selling, the simony that goes on to gain, to gain the power. Uh, and Rome itself, the fighting between families, Rome is in trouble. It loses population. One of the great difficulties is, if you know anything about Rome, it's surrounded by swamps. 
that have to be kept drained, you begin to have plagues that infect Rome. Rome that once had been a city of a couple of million really had begun to reduce to a place probably where there was no more than 50,000 people. And the papacy is up for grabs constantly. Okay. Uh, what happens is in my little notes, 1309, the Pope decides to move to France. So the, what you have is 1309 to 1377, you have the Avignon experience. The Pope moves out of Rome to a uh, much better city. And so he moves to Avignon. It's a much more comfortable city. It doesn't have the heat or the mosquitoes of Rome. And they take over the city of Avignon. Now, the Italian cardinals hate this. And one of the difficulties is they really disparage this whole period because mainly because they're furious that they're no longer in Rome. And so the papacy exists from 1309 to 77. So you're talking about basically 70, I mean, 68 years that the Pope is in Avignon and there are seven Popes. One of the people that is very key in bringing the Pope back to Rome is Catherine of Siena. Catherine of Siena is a lay woman. She lives at home. She has taken private vows as a Dominican, but she lives at home. She doesn't live in a community. And uh, Catherine is an amazing woman. I mean, she's managed to travel from Italy to Avignon and back. And she's the principal cause of bringing the Pope back to Rome. And uh, she's amazing. The works that she wrote, they're all with a secretary. And, uh, you know, in her better moment, she called the Pope Daddy up. Uh, she's not one to tussle with. She is a strong, wonderful woman. And uh, she brings the Pope back to Rome. Unfortunately, what happens is, Shortly after the Pope uh, comes back to Rome, he dies. What happens is during the conclave for the election of the Pope, there is a very violent demonstration outside of the Papal Palace. And it's a crowd that has been called together and they demand that an Italian be elected as Pope. Okay, so Urban VI is elected as Pope. Unfortunately with Urban VI is, to be mildly, he has mental problems. And I mean it, he has mental problems. He has a real persecution complex. Uh, you're dead, and I mean dead. If you happen to be talking with someone and the Pope walks in and you change the subject, because the Pope would think that you were uh, contemplating violence against him. And he'd have you tortured and killed. I mean, it was not a pretty scene. Uh, you know, the poor man was sick. So what happened is the French cardinals, after three of them were killed, the French cardinals decide to flee. So they leave Rome. And what they charge is, is that uh, the election was, they were coerced to electing Urban. That they had, that, you know, they were under threat. So they declare the election invalid. They gather and they elect another man, Clement, as Pope. So what you have now is from 1378 to 1417 is the great Western Schism. You have two popes. And you have two popes in the church. 
They both have their coterie of cardinals and everything. They both have saints that support them, but they're divided along national lines. Uh, France, and to a certain extent Spain, is very much supportive of the Avignon papacy. Uh, Italy, Germany, and England oppose it. But so for, as I say, for uh, some 40 years, you have two popes. Then we had a problem. We had a third pope. Uh, a group of reformers go ahead. They called a meeting at Pisa. And uh, they elect a third pope. Finally, the Roman emperor intervenes. And basically, he gets the Pisa pope to resign. The other pope dies. And the French pope is forced out. And so finally we have Martin in 1417, Martin V, he's at Rome and he becomes once again the Pope of the Western Church. But it just caused all kinds of consternation. You know, the division between the two, the anger, all of this was a real disaster for the church. And remember, you know, 1417 it ends. Uh, and okay, yeah. So uh, one person had mutant them. So uh, it creates difficulties. And remember, this is one of the difficulties that's going to lead to the Protestant Reformation. Uh, Fourteen seventeen. Finally. You have this tremendous bitterness of this division in the church brought about by the great Western schism. And it's going to reverberate. And of course, one of the things that I think that Joan Menninger brought up last week is the 1400s are going to be the great advent of the plague, of the Black Plague that's going to devastate Europe. And uh, if you, if you like trivia, one of the things that happened is in the 1300s, there began to be this idea getting, getting around Europe that cats were agents of the devil. You know, that cats were these devils. And so what you find throughout Europe is they begin to murder cats. You know, and I mean murder them. In other words, just they would hunt them down. Okay, what happened is without the cats is a tremendous rise in the rat population throughout Europe. You know, you Mother Nature doesn't like to be disturbed. And uh, so what you have is the natural enemy of the rats is removed and the rat population erupts. From the rat population, you're going to have the diseases that's going to come and the black plague that infects Europe. And one of the things in the black plague is that priests lived up to their call. They were there with people. And so priests were simply died by the hundreds. Uh, the priests of Europe were really wiped out. And uh, uh, if you look at the percentages of priests compared to the rest of the population, priests are three times as risky to die as the regular population. What's going to happen afterwards? Because of the need of priests, many times priests were hastily ordained without much preparation. And so they are not in any shape, way, or form ready to face uh, the question, the theological questions that are going to be raised in the Protestant Reformation. Uh, and of course, uh, well, that's about it for me for today. It's 50 minutes. I can unmute people if you want to have questions. Put your hand up and I'll recognize you. Or just wave. 
wave. Yes, very clip. Wait, Mary, you're not getting a second. No, I did it. I did it. I did it. Okay. Yeah. I was. I have a question about the early universities. And yes. I wondered about how they were staffed. Were they strictly religious in terms of their of of the professional staff and teachers, or heavily re heavily religious? Yes, heavily religious, and uh, especially at the beginning, in the early days, probably eighty percent religious. And how did they determine if somebody was? A candidate to teach in that university at that time do you know um, I you know I really don't know probably interviews and things like that uh, but you know I, I couldn't be precise on how they hired people you know eventually I'm quite sure eventually they set up systems to evaluate people and who is to be hired but uh, you know at the beginning it was just uh, the religious, the Benedictines, those trained by the Benedictines, uh, but it was primarily religious, yes. Any other questions? Yes, Linda. I have a question regarding um, the practice of indulgence. Yes. And when did that historically begin? Because the practice of indulgence obviously led to um, Martin Luther. Yes. Okay. I was going to. I'll take indulgence as much heavily, much more heavily, in the next talk when we get into the Reformation. The well, how did it begin in in the practices of the church? It, it it starts fairly early, and it starts fairly early, especially when you have uh, the excessive penances that are being put on people. It's an attempt to ameliorate the tremendous penances. For instance, what I said earlier is uh, after the last of the people who had suffered the persecutions, when penance was something that was very public, you went to your church community and you confessed publicly. See, I don't know if you were there earlier when I said, uh, people who had suffered persecution, been tortured, they sort of, the church looked upon them as having the charism of they would carry out forgiveness in the name of the church. Okay, when they were no longer around after peace, uh, penance became a very rigorous thing. And you know, it, you know, it, it, it was really limited. You find some of the early penitential books in some cities where you were only allowed to go to confession five times. If you had a major sin six times, forget it. You were damned. And, uh, and some of the penances were some of the penances were really rigorous, where uh, you had to sit outside of the church for three years every Sunday in sackcloth and ashes, asking for the forgiveness of people. So indulgences were attempts to ameliorate that, you know. Who, who really um, instituted the penance? Who really decreed them? It was the it was the community. Was it or was it papal? No, it was the community. It was very much the community. I mean, this was the drift of this was the drift. Uh, of what was taking place in the sacrament of forgiveness. See, what you, see, see, be careful. A lot of these things didn't start with the Pope. They started with the local church and then reached Rome. See, the, see, a mistake of many people is, we look at the church today, the way it operates, and we sort of read back, that's gonna be the way the church always existed. So much of it started with the local churches and that eventually made its way back to Rome. And so uh, the, the penance system was something that gradually different churches uh, worked out. 
and then eventually they became universal. For instance, for a long time, uh, communion on the tongue was forbidden. It was the sense that uh, communion on the tongue was forbidden because it was a sense that what Jesus is take and eat. He didn't say take and be fed. Uh, so what happened is one of the ways the communion on the tongue began was with Charlemagne. It began in France because Charlemagne had been, you know, Charlemagne basically had been a barbarian, you know, and suddenly now he's the emperor. And one of the ways so often that you find is you have to have a whole set of rules to elevate him. So Charlemagne had a rule, if you touched him, you were killed. He was sacred. You didn't touch him. You always knelt in his presence. Okay. Charlemagne was the protector of the church. And so he demanded, okay, if they can't touch me, why should they touch the Lord? So he gave orders that communion was to be given on the tongue. You don't touch the Lord. And since you had to kneel in his presence, how dare you stand in the presence of the Lord? You knelt. So, and then it took a long while. It took over 100 years for some of these, quote, reforms to reach Rome. Does that answer your question? See, see that's, that's one of the things that some people, we look at the way the present church works because of rapid communication. Things start with Rome. So much in the church history, you find, starts with the local church. Because I see that um, so much of the idea of penance comes from within the orders also, of, of um, beating, you know, beating oneself. The, the yeah. Other... yeah, but th that's... Uh, it, that also exists, but you know, but the orders only come around in the 1200s. But that's that's a slightly different use of the word penance. It's this idea of individual penance, you know, that had to be carried out, uh, and that was strong in the orders. Yes. When did the real practice of indulgence then begin? Practice of indulgences begins around the year 400. Oh, that early. Yes. Yes, local, you know, it was attempts to, uh, so for instance, you know, when you hear, uh, this is worth 300 days. What it originally meant was, this granted you 300 days less of your penance given by the community. That was the original meaning of indulgences. And when did it become money? Um, it, it was a sense of you gave an offering for this. In other words, pe people would say a mass, and you know, and, and of course, and for sometimes what you had is this was the income for priests. Was you know they said a mass for a family, and this is how they lived. It wasn't the best, but that was what existed. Okay. Thank Anyone you. else? Maddie. Yes, Maddie. Hello? What's the book you're reading about the popes? It's a history of the popes, but he's an, he's an Anglican. You know, and he writes about the fact that the popes were the oldest institution in the West. And so he, it's, a, it's a very brief little history just of their dates. And it gives all the anti -popes. and uh, But it's fascinating. OK. But what's the name of it? History of the Popes. Oh. <laughs> I'll, try to, I'll, try to, I'll try to bring it. I'll try to bring it and show it to you next week. OK, great. Thank you. Um, a few of you do not have a picture, so I don't know if you have a question or not. So I'm going to unmute you. Judith, Carol Gleason, Isidore, Marlene, 
and then two phone numbers, just in case you have a phone a question. Any other questions? Yes. I would like to know why the Jesuits were uh, kicked out of Spain and Portugal. Okay. Part of it was, uh, you know, this simplifies it. Uh, but basically what was happening in Spain and Portugal, they were jealous of the Anglican Church. In England, what you had was a church that was totally under the control of the English king. And so what you find in Spain and Portugal is they wanted to establish their own church. And the Jesuits, with their loyalty to Rome, were a big roadblock. Now, that's a little simplified answer, but, but that's a lot to do with it, is... Uh, uh, the Jesuits had done some things that really had alienated the Spanish and Portuguese rulers. Have you ever read about the uh, Jesuit missions in Paraguay, the reductions? Mm -hmm. If you ever saw the movie, uh, what was it, The Mission? Yes. And the Jesuits had established indigenous communities in South America, which bordered the Spanish and Portuguese territories. They protected the Indians from slave raiders. They created wonderful communities. Uh, and the music that they created, the architecture. However, Spain didn't like them. And Spain and Portugal wanted to destroy them. The Jesuits tried to defend it. That was another thing that they hated with the Jesuits. So, uh, but a lot of it also was the fact they wanted a church that they ran. And probably in both countries, there would have been a state church similar to the Anglican church. However, uh, most of this was happening in the 1770s. And 17 years later was going to be the French Revolution. And the French Revolution was going to sweep Europe. What happened with the French Revolution just goes throughout Europe. It wipes out, uh, for instance, in France alone. When the French Revolution starts in 1789, I think there's 160,000 women religious. When it ends, let's say 1815, there are less than 500. Uh, priests disappear. Uh, there's a community, the Crozier Fathers. Beginning of the French Revolution, they had 1800. They are down to three. Uh, the Jesuits finally are rehabilitated and were refounded. But uh, the French Revolution has a tremendous effect throughout Europe. So all of their plans to establish a state church simply collapse. That answer your question? Yes, thank you. Mary Ryan? Yes. yes. Um, could you briefly state the argument that Catherine of Siena used to convince the popes to move? It's just hard to imagine the powers of the papacy saying to this woman, oh, good idea, we'll go back to Rome. I mean, her basic thing was, you are the Bishop of Rome, and you should be there. I mean, that was basically her argument, is, you know, it, it fine. Uh, there are problems in Rome, there's all kinds of disease, but you can rebuild the city. It's up to you, but your place is to be in Rome. You're so, yeah, based on the historical precedent of the Pope is the Bishop of Rome. Yes. Peter was the Bishop of Rome, and mm -hmm. you should live up to it. And as I say, there's a, the, the story of the church during these ages is people were buying and selling the papacy. I mean, Alexander VI was going to be a pope uh, shortly afterwards. And Alexander VI uh, 
One historian said the greatest thing about Alexander VI was he was the doting father. All right, that's not exactly the greatest uh, enconium for a pope. I mean, he bought the papacy. He literally did. The simony that was involved in buying the papacy. And, uh, and the murders that were involved with him. Uh, some of these low moments. Uh, see, so often a bishopric was worth a lot of money. The stipend that went along with being a bishop of a diocese was, was a lot. So, for instance, you're going to find out, for instance, uh, Ferdinand the Catholic, the husband of Isabel. Okay. Uh, he had two daughters. But he had a number of children, as we say, outside the sheets. And uh, one of them, Alphonsus, uh, Ferdinand, he can't, he's illegitimate, or a bastard, whichever you want. He's a, he can't inherit. So Ferdinand loves his children. So he takes care of them. So one of them, Alphonsus, he makes the Archbishop of Saragossa. He's 19 years old. And he's installed as the Archbishop of Saragossa, giving a wonderful palace. I think the, his son celebrated Mass, if I remember right, five times in his life. But he's the Archbishop, mainly because there's a wonderful stipend that goes with it. And what happens is, Alphonsus then has a son who he installs as his successor, Alphonsus II, Archbishop of Saragossa. I, this is one of the great weaknesses of the church is the absentee things. What you do is uh, you love the income. So you create an auxiliary or a vicar general to run the church and you get the income. I mean, very briefly, Cardinal Wolsey. Cardinal Wolsey is the chancellor of England, but he's also the papal legate. He's the Archbishop of York. And one of the things that happens is he never gets to York, his archdiocese. He never enters the territory of the archdiocese of York until two days before his death. But he's the archbishop because he gets the income. Uh, he had made himself archbishop of York, papal legate. He was, he made himself the bishop of five other dioceses in England. He was the abbot of 11 monasteries and the prior of 17 monasteries of women, mainly to get the income. He was the wealthiest man in Europe. He built Hampton Court. Now, eventually, he realized that uh, he was richer than the king. And this didn't go over very well with Henry VIII. So this was part of his downfall. So he gives Hampton Court to the king because he wants to save his neck. But he's also the chancellor of England. Uh, but I, as I say, this was endemic is they were using this, the absentee bishoprics. We're gonna see with Martin Luther is Albrecht of Mainz had bought on loans from the bank the Fugger Bank, uh, he paid simony to have himself named Archbishop of Mainz. Okay. He figured from the income from the diocese, I can pay this loan back. All right, there was a recession in Germany. There wasn't the money there. And of course, the people in Rome, uh, you know, weren't getting there. Well, they had been paid. And so he's in trouble. A German bank is furious. He has, you know, his loan is, uh, is outstanding. So what happened is Rome allows this so-called indulgence to be preached. But what you have is 50% of it is to go to the bank. So when Tetzel is preaching, uh, what you have is there was an agent of the bank collecting his half plus probably interest on the money. So, uh, I mean, these are some of the problems that you're facing is in the church, the lack of training for priests, uh, 
unless you're in a religious community, many times you're not really well trained. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. God bless. I will see you next week. And then I just want to invite you next Friday is the Feast of St. Ignatius. Yeah. And so uh, we will have our Mass at 9 o'clock just before this, but I invite any of you to join in that special Mass for St. Ignatius next Friday at 9 o'clock. So God bless. Have a wonderful week and good to be with you. Yeah. Okay. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs> the age of miracles is not over. That's right. Yeah, miracles do happen. <laughs>